Uh, so it's so lovely to have everyone here today. And we are, are delighted uh, that Caroline is with us. So with no further ado, uh, today we have Caroline Ruggiero. She is the CEO of Truly You Hair and Scalp Clinic. She is proud to be one of the first practicing certified trichologists in Canada. She is a board member with the International Association of Trichologists, a member of the World Trichology Society, and president of the Canadian Hair Loss Council. As the program director for Truly You Academy, she is also an instructor for the Hair Practitioner Certificate course from AIAT. And Caroline's lifelong mission is to spread awareness for the trichological sciences. Uh, so we so are excited to have Caroline with us here today. And uh, my name is Elizabeth Papadopoulos. I'm the director of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. Uh, Caroline has been very generous and there are four giveaways today. So right after her lecture, uh, we will do a Q&A. And just before the Q&A, we will pick four winners from today's session. So stick around for that. And then Caroline will be delighted to take any Q&As that you have. So it's about a 45 minute lecture uh, discussion and then the Q&A right after that. All right, Caroline. Ready, okay. So let's see if we can connect here. Okay, just give me a thumbs up, maybe, Elizabeth, when you can see that. Yeah, that looks great. Hopefully everybody can see that. Hopefully the audio is working well. Perfect. Okay. So off we go. So hair. Um, really, I mean, I see this a lot in the clinic that hair is a barometer for what is happening in the body. And I thought, what more of an appropriate uh, topic for today? Um, you know, hair is the fastest growing tissue on the body. Uh, so it can very much be the first sign that something is changing. And, um, and unfortunately, it's, it's neglected uh, as that first change of something that's happening within the body. But hopefully today, I will give you some examples of how paying attention to what's happening to your hair, to your scalp can give you some insight into your health. And let me just... Okay, here we go. Okay, so we've already had the intro. That's me, the very nice sort of filtered version, but <laughs> me nonetheless. Uh, so yes, as Elizabeth just said, uh, we have a lovely clinic here in Mississauga bordering Oakville. Um, I am an IET trichologist. I will talk a little bit about the IET at the end for those of you that are interested in, in learning a little bit more about being certified um, as a trichologist. Uh, the president of the Hair Canadian Hair Loss Council, of course, which is a newly uh, sort of started organization that I created out of COVID, uh, if not out of COVID, but during COVID, where I saw a real need for spreading awareness for um, hair loss patients and hair loss information research. And then, of course, we have the Trulio Academy, uh, which I'll talk about. And again, I won't repeat myself, but Yes, I'd like to spread awareness for trichology and hopefully I'm doing that today. A few little pictures of our clinic here in Mississauga. Um, uh, we are on the Queensway for those of you that are from the GTA, uh, not too far from Sherway Gardens. Our clinic is equipped with um, uh, multiple pri private rooms uh, for scalp therapy treatments, hair replacement. We uh, treat men, women, and children with a variety of different hair, hair and scalp disorders. And we also offer hair replacement solutions for those that can't find a solution in with medical or trichological therapies. So trico what? For those of you that have never heard this word before. And I think that number becomes smaller and smaller every year because this uh, field seems to be growing very rapidly. But the word trichology is derived from the Greek word trichos, meaning hair. And uh, essentially trichology is the science of the structure, function, and diseases of the human hair. And in the clinical sense, trichology is the diagnosis and treatment of disorders and diseases of the scalp and hair. It's not uh, necessarily an alternative medicine or complementary therapy. A lot of the uh, the the, the uh, diagnostic 
approaches that we use are similar to what a medical um, uh, practitioner would use. The um, solutions vary, but the recommendations are, are similar in many cases that a medical uh, doctor would make for uh, a lot of these hair loss issues. I really see trichology as the bridge between cosmetology and dermatology. I think cosmetology uh, focuses more on the aesthetic part of uh, a hair loss or scalp issue. And dermatology, as we know, especially in Canada, um, has a primary focus on skin and skin disorders, with skin cancer probably being the, the, the primary area of concern. And as trichologists, we, we, we really attempt to bridge that gap. And we realize that, you know, losing hair is not just aesthetic that scalp disorders are um, uh, very uh, serious and, and can be in, in cases where they're chronic, uh, debilitating for many people. Um, so that's who I am. I'm a bridge between these two worlds. Oh, I'm having trouble moving the slides. Okay, so what's the difference between dermatology and trichology? Um, and I think that's important to understand. A dermatologist is a physician who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of skin problems. Whereas a trichologist like myself is a hair and scalp specialist who assesses the causes of fall, breakage, thinning, miniaturization, diseases of the scalp, and we treat accordingly. It's true that visiting a dermatologist can be an important and uh, sometimes very necessary component of the treatment of a specific uh, hair or scalp disorder. But it's also true that many dermatologists don't treat the most common hair loss issues. So androgenetic alopecia, alopecia or hair loss due to nutritional deficiencies, collagen effluvium, which is a reactional hair loss. Many dermatologists don't treat this issue. Um, in fact, and I'm not sure if anyone in the group here has had a hair loss disorder and uh, attempted at getting a referral to a dermatologist, and perhaps that attempt wasn't successful because you heard back from your doctor that your dermatologist isn't seeing hair loss patients. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not an uncommon um, story, and it's not uncommon uh, to hear that across the world. So as a trichologist, I am that guide for this individual suffering in silence in a place where really they don't have uh, many options and many places to get answers. So where do you go and who do you talk to when you have a hair loss issue? Do you go to your higher hairstylist? I mean, probably. I do a lot of presentations to hair schools. And my argument there is, as a hairstylist, you may be, they may be the first ones that actually see the hair issue. Would you go to your family doctor? That's also very common. You don't know what's happening. You panic. And, of course, you want to see a professional a medical practitioner. A dermatologist, hopefully, I mean, if you're lucky to get a referral to a dermatologist, hopefully you get to see, you get to see one within a timely uh, period. But without proper guidance, uh, where do clients, patients really go for information? And I think that none of you will be surprised to see the next slide here. But of course, we all love to go to Dr. Google. So um, Dr. Google has a lot of great ideas. There's a lot of self-proclaimed experts, a lot of uh, self-proclaimed, um, um, you know, uh, trichologists. Trichology as, it, as, as, um, uh, as a field, specifically in Canada, is not governed by a college. So uh, theoretically speaking, anybody can kind of start a page or a, a, a blog and say, I'm a trichologist, I have the answer for you. And what I like to sort of mention here is that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If there was a cure for hair loss, um, everybody would be using that cure, right? If I had a cure for hair loss today and I was advertising it, I'd, I'd probably be richer than Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I'd be very wealthy very quickly and nothing else would exist. But there's a lot of things that exist out there on the market for hair loss. And we'll talk about why there's so many different solutions. But, you know, don't go to Dr. Google is my sort of main message here. Uh, go to somebody that knows what they're talking about. And why don't you go to Dr. Google? Well, I mean, self-diagnosis is more often than not misdiagnosis. And how many of us have gone down that rabbit hole? I mean, I'm probably guilty of this as well. When something's wrong, I'm immediately on 
all kinds of platforms trying to figure out what's going on. And, and if I didn't know any better, I probably would be rubbing ginger and lavender and salt palmetto and garlic and onion and eggs. And, you know, if I had alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune hair loss disorder, I'd probably see, a, you know, a, a posting about natural remedies for alopecia areata because I don't want to do anything medical. I don't want to take this medication. I don't want any side effects. So, you know, this, these, these, these ideas, although I'm sure that all of these solutions, and I mean that honestly, probably have worked for somebody or something, but it's misleading. It's misleading to say that you have uh, a cure for a specific hair loss issue. And I mean, I think get the answer first, go to the professional, and then how you decide to treat that issue will be up to you, but find out what's going on first. And so who do you see first? <laughs> so of course, my argument is see a certified trichologist because we are trained to analyze your hair and scalp using a variety of different tools. Because many hair and scalp disorders have viable non-prescription treatments, you can save months of time uh, and energy. And if you require medical intervention, I think a trichologist is in a place where they guide you towards that. I can certainly differentiate between a disorder that requires a topical or oral or systemic medication versus a female pattern or male pattern hair loss that requires, you know, either dermacosmetic products or possibly even low grade prescription topicals, as well as nutritional therapies, of course. So when you come to see a trichologist, what do we do? How do we know what's going on? How do we identify the issue? And there's a lot of different tools that we use. The first tool is actually looking at the scalp and having a conversation with the patient in the same way that a nutritionist would have a discussion, a questionnaire, an intake form, we do the same thing. We have to analyze the, case, the patient's case history, uh, their diet, their lifestyle, their genetic predisposition before we actually physically look at the scalp. But once we look at the scalp, one of the first things that we do is actually a skin diagnostic. So we will use um, a pH meter, a hydration meter, and a sebum reader to identify the health of the hydrolipidic film. And this can give us a lot of insight into the health of the scalp, and in some cases uh, can actually help me identify if there are more complicated autoimmune hair loss disorders happening in certain areas of the scalp. These, this is what these tools look like. So it's skin diagnostic measurement, um, a sebum reader, a hydration meter, a wireless pH meter. Why is this important? Well, the scalp is an extension of the skin on the face, and just like the skin on the face, a good pH for the scalp can uh, create a healthier environment for the hair to grow in. And what is that healthy pH? For those of you that understand skin or have a cosmetology background, we know that about four and a half to five and a half. So a little bit acidic. We can see the pH on this screen. It's of 8.38. That's way too high for the scalp. Um, and something that I don't have in a slide, but came to mind that I have to mention here because I'll, I'll never forgive myself if I don't. Um, I see a lot of uh, children sometimes with seborrheic dermatitis or cradle cap, okay? And this cradle cap is really a yeast that develops on the scalp. And the first thing I will ask, not the child, but the parent, is what shampoo are you using? And they will often reply with, oh, I'm using this tear-free, all-natural shampoo. And immediately I go, oh my gosh, not tear-free. Or worst case scenario, nothing against Johnson & Johnson, but... It's the Johnson and Johnson Johnson baby shampoo. I probably wouldn't even wash my dogs with. Um, I may get killed for that later. That comment, but it's true. So why? Why don't we want to use something tear free? Um, the scalp needs to keep a pH of uh, a four and a half and five and a half in order to kill off microbes and to keep that scalp balanced. When we use a tear free shampoo, that shampoo tends to be very alkaline, and the alkalinity of that shampoo will raise the pH of the skin, thus creating a breeding ground for what? Yeast. So the best thing you can do for a baby or, or a child that has a, cra uh, a cradle cap uh, outside of gently removing it with a maybe uh, a soft bristle brush and a little bit of uh, an oil or, or, or a gentle um, uh, cream cleanser is staying away from that tear-free shampoo. So that was just a little nugget of information. 
Of course, we use a micro camera triposcope. I put dermoscope here. Dermoscope generally is used by a dermatologist, but dermoscope is a fine tool to use for trichologists as well. But generally speaking, we use a micro camera or a triposcope. Another tool that we use is polarized light microscopy. So we use a microscope, absolutely. But under polarized light, we are able to see incredible pieces of information. And we're actually hosting a course this week uh, in polarized light microscopy. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's also a particularly interesting form of analysis for the nutritionist or even the naturopathic doctor. And I'll just tell you why very quickly. Polarized light microscopy enables us to see in real time if the hair is not just growing properly. We can see based on the colors that show up in the polarized light if that hair is absorbing nutrients properly. We can see when that individual went through stress based on defects of keratinization. Um, when they went through deficiency, how much hair they're losing, um, and what kind of hair loss they have. So this is an incredible new technology. Polarized light microscopy itself is not new, but the way that we've um, uh, learned how to use it with the Italian Academy of Hair Microscopy is, is quite different and, and very exciting. AI. So where is AI not these days? Um, we also use AI and AI helps us uh, count the hairs on the head. So we can take baseline measurements and determine how many terminal vellus hairs, how many thin, medium hairs, thick hairs. Um, and this helps us sort of guide the patient on therapies and, and what's working, what isn't. We do some lab work as well. So food intolerance testing, hair cortisol analysis, hair mineral analysis. And a sort of a typical report can look something like this. This is uh, with one with the software that we use. Uh, some of the images, and I I I, I assumed I'm, I'm speaking to mostly a professional group, but I have been told in the past that they're a little bit too graphic, and I, I hope that nobody uh, is offended by that today. <laughs> so uh, just sort of a disclaimer there. But um, uh, this is, I, I suppose, after some time when I look at these images, nothing, nothing surprises me, but this is a typical scalp with somebody who has a disorder called uh, folliculitis decalvans. And this is a scarring alopecia uh, where an infection also develops around the scalp. So the tools that I use in the clinic help me identify exactly what's happening in the scalp and how to treat it. So hair, a barometer for what is happening in the body. And that's what we were taught to talk about. So we'll use these tools. I will use these tools to, along with analyzing patient case history and blood work to determine the underlying cause of hair loss. And what causes someone's hair loss or scalp issue can be complicated. And it's usually a combination of genetic and epigenetic factors. As I've already mentioned a few times, the fastest growing tissue on the body, I want to say in the body, I believe it's stomach lining. So just you can somebody else can check that for me, but on the body it's definitely the uh, the hair, and uh, depending on how much hair we're losing, how the texture is changing, the curl pattern sometimes can even change, can definitely be a sign that something is changing within the body. And I want everybody to remember that your scalp is like soil, and I love this, and we've been saying this for many many years, and I'm hearing it more and more often now, and it's absolutely true. The quality of that soil is really dependent on many things, but in the same way that the quality of your hair and uh, scalp is is uh, connected to your health, the quality of soil is connected to the uh, the health of the plant. So um, we are I am here to sort of make the claim that your wellness, your health is absolutely going to result in healthier hair, a healthier scalp, but one cannot exist without the other. So on the note of wellness, um, this uh, little graphic is from 2020 now, and um, it's probably no surprise to any of you that the global wellness market is enormous, and it was estimated to be about 4.3 trillion in 2020, and that's in the U.S. And we know that since then it's growing 12 percent annually. And when I came across this next graphic, I thought this was really interesting because it showed where people are concentrating their time, their energy, and, and really their money when it comes to well, the wellness world. And you can see here these two large, the two largest circles are personal care and beauty, healthy eating and nutrition. But we do what we don't see is a connection between these two. And that's what I sort of want to uh, touch on today. 
So I've already said the number one wellness sector is, yes, of course, personal care and beauty. Number two is healthy eating, nutrition, and weight loss. And it's safe to assume that trichology, hair health, scalp health, of all these different territory, categories will, would probably fall best under personal care um, and beauty. And I'm here to really make the argument that this connection is so, so important and it really is missing. The connection between personal care and beauty, so hair and scalp health in this case, and healthy eating and nutrition. One does affect the other. And these two areas, these two groups would really do well working together. So if hair is a barometer for what happens within the body, oh, to truly, truly um, help a patient with their hair loss and their scalp disorder in a holistic way, we have to work from the outside in and we have to work from the inside out. This means there's a unique and important opportunity for trichologists and nutritionists, but I will also put naturopathic doctors here. I would also love to put medical doctors here, dermatologists, and slowly these worlds are starting to work closer together. And the more we can combine our efforts, the faster we can help the patient and achieve results. So how do we know what normal hair loss is? So if you're a nutritionist and you're seeing, maybe you're interested in trichology, you're seeing a patient with, with hair loss issue, how do you know what's normal and what's not normal? And if you're a trichologist, hopefully you know the difference, but let's talk about that a little bit. So about 85% of the hairs on the adult scalp are in the antigen phase of the hair cycle. So this is the growing phase. About 1% is in the catagen phase or transitional phase. And about 14% is in the telogen phase or the shedding phase. And I did put here in slightly smaller words and angled that in polarized light, those numbers and percentages are a little bit different. Now I had to do that because of my own I don't know, understanding of, of this hair disorder. But the bottom line is this, the majority of the hair on the head is always growing. So the majority of the hair on the head is always reacting and acting and doing things and compare. And, and that is really uh, um, uh, uh, a sign of what somebody is going uh, through either hormonally, um, either uh, having to do with their health, um, because this tissue is constantly changing. The antigen phase, the growth phase, lasts on average about four years. It can be a little bit longer, so maybe five or six years. Um, and definitely it can be a lot less if you have something like hereditary or androgenetic alopecia. Something to know um, that most of you probably don't know is that this antigen growth phase tends to be longer in women, and it is shorter in men. And that could be the reason why women, uh, even though many women choose to grow their hair longer, um, a lot don't, but if they all you know, decided to grow our hair very long, we'd probably do a better job at it than the majority of men. This means that on average, it is normal to lose about 30 to 50 hairs a day. So the majority of our hair is growing, some is transitioning, and some is shedding. It's normal to lose hair every day. So how much is, is too much? If you want to sit there and count your hair, I would say probably 70 to 80 is a little bit too much. And some you know professionals will say 50 to 100 is normal. But I would say that 70 to 80, you're, you're getting up there. 500 plus is definitely excess shedding. So now we're probably dealing with a condition called telogen effluvium, which is a temporary self-corrective hair loss that we'll explain in a moment. Some common hair loss disorders that I wanted to talk about. So I always like to start with male pattern hair loss because um, it is definitely the most common form of hair loss in men. And for a lot of the men that I see, um, they really, you know, especially the ones that are very concerned about their loss, they'd like to uh, believe that there are other epigenetic factors causing this issue. Uh, and I'm here to say probably not. Those epigenetic factors like how you're eating, how you're sleeping, how much you're working out, how you style your hair, you know, how often you're wearing a hat. These things can maybe make the, 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 the problem a little bit worse. But at the end of the day, this is a dominant trait for men, meaning that if a young man um, or a baby boy is born to a, a, a family where at least 
one man on one side of the family has patterned hair loss, he has at least a 50% chance of inheriting that hair loss issue. So men are very sensitive to this kind of hair loss issue. And one of the causes is, yes, androgens uh, or male hormones, specifically uh, dehydrotestosterone or DHT. And uh, there are other causes. It's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just DHT. But uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll say that's one of the main factors. What treatments are available for male pattern hair loss? So for those of you that um, know uh, or heard of minoxidil, here I'm talking about Rogaine. And that's pretty available at most local drugstores, Costco. If uh, for men that are candidates, there's much higher uh, concentrations available through a prescription. But that is a pretty uh, standard topical treatment for male hair loss. Finasteride, which is a DHT blocker, and that can be taken orally or topically. LLLT stands for low level light. Like therapy and this is a red light therapy prp nutraceuticals and these are just a few of the solutions that are i want to say clinically proven to help with male pattern hair loss correction men are very good candidates for um hair transplants so hair that kind of hair replacement uh because uh the hair that's affected in men is generally at the top of the head and the crown um, and the hair at the back of the head or the occipital area, their donor hair remains fairly intact. It's not as affected by androgens and all the other sort of uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, predispositions of this kind of hair loss. But what's important to note here is that even if um, somebody has a hair transplant, right? Men are very good candidates for hair transplants. This is a chronic progressive form of hair loss. This is not a hair loss that is going to be uh, fixed overnight, even with a transplant. As long as the issue exists, as long as the person has a biological predisposition, they have to do something for that problem. And that something will usually be a combination of all of the things I've mentioned above, depending on that person's lifestyle or budget. Another common hair loss disorder, of course, is female pattern hair loss. And unlike male pattern hair loss, women with this kind of hair loss will not go completely bald. And I hate using the B word, but they will not lose all of the hair on their the top of their heads. There is something called male pattern hair loss in women, but this is not what we're talking about here. Female pattern hair loss um, is, you know, one of the, the, the characteristic features is a diffuse thinning, but um, there is almost always a little bit more thinning in the vertex, so in the crown and the frontal area compared to the back of the head. Hormonal imbalances can uh, trigger this kind of hair loss. Menopause, as we know, can also, which we'll talk about in a minute, can uh, make this problem worse a hysterectomy, an age, of course, can trigger this as well, because as women age, as we come out of our reproductive years, the bottom line is uh, we become a little bit more sensitive to male androgens. And those androgen receptors are on the top of the head, on the crown, and in also the temporal area here. So it's going to, uh, if it hasn't happened, you know, up until menopause, it's likely the hair can change around that time. Treatments, treatments, treatments for female pattern hair loss. We can talk about this for probably hours. So it's, it's pretty difficult to kind of put this into one slide. But, but bottom line is treatment for female pattern hair loss can be similar to male pattern in the sense that we want to use topicals. We maybe want to use an oral medication. We maybe want to use nutraceuticals. Androgens or male hormones also play a role, but not in the same way as in males unless there is a hormonal imbalance. So if a young woman has been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, then of course we know that she's not just more sensitive to male androgens, she may be producing more male androgens. So we have to treat it a little bit differently. Some of the options can be minoxidil, but at a lower dose, because if we go too high for women, uh, excessive facial, facial hair can be an issue. Other topicals, um, there are millions of topicals out there for hair loss. Um, and if I haven't said it already, I'll say it now. When there's no cure for something, everybody claims to have a cure. 
And I love to make a comparison of the treatment of female hair loss to the treatment of aging. And as some of you, well, probably all of you know, there is no cure for aging. I wish there was a cure, but uh, there isn't. So uh, you can't pop a pill or use a cream and suddenly look like you're 22 years old again. But just because there's no cure for something, it doesn't mean there isn't care. There isn't treatment for aging. And hair loss is very much the same. We know that if in terms of aging, if we take care of our bodies, if we eat right, if we exercise, if we take care of our skin, um, we will look younger longer. Uh, and hair is very much the same. Depending on our genes, we have to do more and some of us have to do less. But at the end of the day, the key is finding the combination of solutions that is going to work for you. Nutraceuticals, which we'll talk about as well, I just put here biotin, no. If you're taking biotin to grow your hair, I'm going to say it's probably not doing very much. If, it's, if you're seeing an improvement maybe in your nails or in other areas, please go ahead. It's not harmful. Uh, but biotin, you know, has shown us time and time again, there's no real change in hair growth. Uh, cycling and in, in hair growth in general. So I would stay away from biotin, especially uh, at 10,000 milligrams or more, because the FDA um, did happen to release a statement now, it was probably about three years ago, uh, um, uh, explaining that in that amount or more, a uh, blood work can be affected. So if you are taking 10,000 milligrams of biotin, I would say, uh, you know, let your doctor know before you do your blood work. You really want to uh, investigate epigenetic factors. So diet, sleep, exercise, medication. Why is that particularly important with female pattern hair loss? Because in female hair loss, where genes, where androgens don't play as big of a role, we really have to look at all of these epigenetic factors. And I think that treating female pattern hair loss can be um, very exciting in that way. Another common hair loss disorder is telogen effluvium. So telogen effluvium is just a fancy word for shedding, excess shedding. This is a temporary self-corrective hair loss. And I just have to take a sip, excuse me. <laughs> Can't edit things out because we're live. Um, so uh, I've, I've, I've put on a few patterns and not many people have seen this. So this was actually from a conference I went to several years ago, but there's actually specific patterns that have been identified as being more common with this kind of reactional hair loss. And I, there's a reason that I put this on the screen. Um, I told you I love to spread sort of awareness for the trichological sciences, but awareness in general, because we live in a culture where they can, you know, it's easy to self-diagnose, it's easy to see all kinds of information online. And one of the things that I commonly see with um, hair loss solutions that are advertised online is there's pictures of the temporal area and a recession, and there's a before picture where a young woman man is missing hair here and then all of a sudden there's an after picture where it's all filled in and so and so person advertises their product and claims to have a cure for hair loss well i'm here to tell you that if you see a before and after like that it was probably telogen effluvium so it was probably a temporary self-corrective hair loss and why does this temp temporary self-corrective hair loss occur usually it's because of temporary issues like uh, surgery illness covid a vaccine, postpartum hair loss, all of these things can cause this sudden shedding. And if you just wait, you know, the hair will probably grow back uh, unless there's an underlying issue, which is where a trichologist can help. So if there's, of course, a deficiency or a nutritionist for that matter, of course, we want to correct that too, because then the hair won't recover fully. Another common hair loss disorder, uh, trichotillomania. Um, and I like to always, you know, put this up on the screen because uh, regardless of the industry that I'm speaking to, this is a often misdiagnosed and misunderstood disorder. And I have seen somewhat of an increase uh, in this disorder over the past few years. Um, and I can't really uh, claim if it's the result of, you know, the added stress that's, you know, kind of ensued worldwide with COVID and with anxiety and, and everything that we've experienced, but certainly this is a problem. Um, this is a pair pulling disorder. So 
It is something that when first glance can look like somebody's cut their hair, you know, with the naked eye, or possibly could look like something autoimmune or maybe an infection. But it is, it is, it is self-inflicted. Um, and uh, the only way to really identify it, because sometimes people come will not be, uh, you know, forthright with you and, and tell you their story, uh, is really with trichoscopy. And with trichoscopy, some of these very specific signs where we see V-shaped coiled flame hairs, hairs that look like hair powder, that we know that there is a hair pulling disorder at play. And you can recommend therapy. You can recommend nutritional sort of guidelines. But at the end of the day, that individual, um, especially if they're adult, may need psychotherapy, may need medication. With a child, it's a little bit different. But in general, this isn't something that is um, uh, caused by disorder in the body. It is something that is self-inflicted. So I think it's important to recognize that difference. Alopecia. So that word alopecia, for those of you that don't know, means hair loss. So when I say something like androgenetic alopecia, I'm referring to male pattern, female pattern hair loss. When I say something like alopecia areata, totalis and universalis, I'm referring to an autoimmune form of hair loss. So this is where the immune system decides to attack the hair bulb and tells the hair to stop growing. I mean, it's in a very sort of simplistic way to put it, but that's, that's essentially what happens. And the hair growth cycle shuts off and the hair decides to break off and fall out. And some of those uh, uh, features that we see under a trichoscope or a, uh, a micro camera are seen here. So we see an exclamation mark hair, we call it a broken hair, a black dot, a yellow dot. Sometimes you'll see this in, in men with beards. You know, you'll see these little patches of missing hair. With beards, I mean, they, they, they can't tend to correct themselves. Uh, some men will opt for intralesional injections of steroids in their, in their face. But to be honest, I've seen them correct themselves. Sometimes you'll see a little patch of hair loss on the head. So if you encounter these issues, know that we're dealing with an autoimmune disorder. Uh, if you see a before and after online of somebody using a topical that has magically cured this autoimmune issue, I would be skeptical. This is a disorder that is unpredictable, that can change and evolve over time. And although there are many therapies, there are there's no known cure. Scarring alopecia, I do want to mention here because I do believe scarring alopecia is on the rise. I have used the word epidemic. Um, and I'm, I'm comfortable using it here today because it's certainly, uh, I'm seeing many cases, many more every year. Um, and this is seen in Caucasian, Afro-American, Canadians. What happens with this type of alopecia is the immune system, because this is an autoimmune disorder as well, doesn't just attack the hair bulb. It attacks the stem, stem cells in the bulge of the hair. And when these stem cells are no longer present, what happens is the hair doesn't just fall out. There's a lot of things that happen, but um, along the course of this, this disorder, but essentially once the inflammation begins and the hair effectively falls out, the, hair, the skin begins to scar over the follicle. And it's really important to understand the difference between this kind of disorder versus other hair loss disorders, because I can tell you that the patient that you see in the middle of the screen there was told for about 25 years that she has genetic hair loss. She was told this is not anything unusual. It's genes, you're aging. She came to see me and I told her, I'm sorry to tell you, but this is not genetic. Uh, there is a genetic component to autoimmune disorders, but this is an autoimmune scalp disorder, a scarring alopecia. We cannot rub anything on that area to make the hair grow back at this stage. We may have to look at hair replacement. So let's switch gears a little bit. Scalp issues. So scalp issues are probably one of my favorite things to treat. Um, if done properly, you can see improvement very quickly and they can definitely indicate things in terms of health. And there are things that can be done almost immediately, both topically and internally that can improve the environment that your hair is growing in your scalp. So what is the most common thing that I hear? I have dandruff. I have dandruff. What is dandruff? Dandruff means flakes. Dandruff can be all kinds of things. So 
it could be an uncomplicated uh, disorder, but it could be a more serious disorder. Many people assume that dandruff is the result of dry skin and often resort to oiling techniques. So whether it's coconut, olive, rosemary, some kind of oil is applied to the scalp because <gasps> I have dandruff, it's dry skin, I better put oil on it. Is that the best thing to do? We'll find out. This habit of putting oil on the scalp when we see something like dandruff could actually make the problem worse in some cases. It can take you from more of a mild problem to a more severe problem very quickly. And you may not even know it because you can't see it with the naked eye. So what do you do? What is the first step? How do you determine what scalp issue you have and how to treat it? Of course, I'm going to say see a trichologist, but you can do something yourself. So first of all, you have to identify, is this an oily dandruff or oily flaky, or is this a dry dandruff? I've already said that most people think they have the, the dandruff they're seeing is dried up skin, but is it really? And how do we know the difference? Well, first we look. And when we look at our scalps, we want to see, do the scales, so this uh, dandruff, these flakes have a yellow color. Is there erythema? Is there redness? Is there flaking on the shoulders? And here we're talking about oily dandruff. So oily dandruff, you won't see flaking on the shoulders. Odor, oily dandruff tends to have an odor, whereas dry dandruff usually doesn't. The location of an oily dandruff tends to be in the hairline, the top of the head, sometimes in the eyebrows. That is typically where we see oily dandruff. So if you see flakes, dandruff, that are yellow, there's where there's redness. If you don't see flaking on the shoulders, but maybe you scratch your head and you see it under your nails, you probably have an oily dandruff. Some things to ask yourself or the person that's trying to identify what dandruff, what kind of dandruff they have is, when is your scalp itchy? Is it itchy right after you wash it, or does it progressively get worse as time goes on? How old are you? Your life, what's your lifestyle like? What are your washing habits? When do you see the flakes? When you brush, scratch, or all the time? And the reason I'm, before I go to the next slide, that these questions are important is I can tell you that when the scalp is oily, the itchiness usually gets worse progressively as time goes on. Because of course, the scalp needs time to, or the sebaceous gland needs time to develop and, and, and produce oil. So that oil will keep developing and the itchiness will get worse and worse. And why? Because we've already mentioned that oil is acidic. It's a waxy, acidic ester. And as it uh, over accumulates on the scalp, that waxy acid is gonna cause discomfort. So if you're feeling progressively more itchy as time goes on, you probably have an oily dandruff. What is your age? If you are of reproductive age, I'll tell you your dandruff is probably more on the oily side. Dry dandruff is less common, and we'll talk about that next. And then when do you see flakes? So we've already said, if you see them on your shoulders, they're probably of a drier nature. But if you see them when you brush or when you scratch, the dandruff is probably more oily. And this is what oily uh, dandruff Will look like, or we also refer to it as sebraic dermatitis when it's a little bit more, um, I'm going to say moderate to severe. Common causes of oily dandruff, hormonal changes. So what happens to the skin, to the scalp when we go through puberty? We start to produce more oil. Our sebaceous glands activate. Why? Sebum is a defense mechanism of the skin. And when hormones change, the skin will react with uh, creating, uh, um, in some cases, acne, but in worst cases, it can be cystic acne and that, which needs a different form of treatment. But in general, teenagers will get acne. And sometimes that acne when, <laughs> can come back in menopause. So what happens in menopause? Again, another hormonal change. So hormonal changes can cause an oily dandruff. So for those women going through a menopause, starting to break out again, or maybe their scalp is getting oily, you're not going through puberty again, but it is is—it is absolutely probably more of an oily dandruff that you're dealing with at that stage. What else can cause oily dandruff? Irregular washing. So if you have an oily scalp type, if you tend to wash more, less frequently rather, 
I guarantee you that you're making the scalp probably more uh, itchy and irritated and causing definitely a separate dermatitis and creating a worse environment for the hair to grow in. But it's not just about frequency. So you can wash your scalp every day if you have an oily scalp type. It's also about the ingredients. Just like skin care, scalp care has different ingredients for different scalp types. So if you're washing your scalp every day with a heavy moisturizing um, uh, shampoo, it's probably not ridding the the scalp of, of those um, issues that are causing an oily dandruff. So I'd like everybody, you know, that says that when we have this conversation about oily scalps and frequency, I, I, I tell people, ask yourself if your face was oily or if it is oily, does washing it less frequently improve your skin or make it worse? So if you have the skin type, would you wash your face once a week, twice a week, or would you apply coconut oil on your face and sleep with it for a few days expecting that it would make it better i'm gonna guess probably not so the same thing is applied to the scalp why would we think that washing an oily scalp less frequently will make it healthier i have lots of theories on that but it's very common across the board every age group culture gender everyone that i've seen um, has this idea initially that washing the hair less is better for it, you know? Um, I want the natural oils to come and do all kinds of magical things and grow my hair. Well, usually that's not the case. So oily dandruff, let's connect that to, to, to health now in terms of diet. When I see somebody with oily dandruff, what are some of the recommendations that I make? Well, of course, and most of you will know this, avoiding trans fats, focusing on healthy fats is important. Having a balanced diet, definitely not steering towards, it's my the left part of my screen, and I think yours too, sleeping well. And there are some supplements that I can I recommend as well for individuals that have oily dandruff. Zinc and MSN are two of them. And I'll focus on the zinc today because zinc is incredible. A lot of people are zinc deficient, as, as you may all know, uh, specifically in southern Ontario. Zinc is antibacterial. It can actually control excess sebum and inhibit or block DHT. It has anti-inflammatory properties. It regulates keratinocyte formation. Um, it can help address clogged pores, oxidize sebum, which are like, is like, like blackheads in the pores. Uh, and some of the best sources are seafood, meat, poultry. Um, and it's also necessary for protein synthesis. So here we go again. Yeah, great food sources. And a good nutritionist will tell you that, of course, food is the best source of nutrition. We do need to supplement because we are deficient in many areas and our food is as well. But when you're, if you're eating uh, right and you're buying food, uh, you know, seasonally and locally, and uh, these are great sources of zinc. Little note about blood work. So zinc hair sufficiency, you can see here, 8.7 to 19.1 seems to be the sufficiency for hair. A normal daily dosage is 10 milligrams. Um, for a person with scalp disorders, I would probably recommend 22 milligrams or even hair loss disorders or up to 50. Um, above, uh, up, to, up to, I don't want to say up to 660 milligrams uh, or 150 milligrams elemental zinc daily. Um, uh, and that's zinc sulfate with the 660 is for a medical prescription, but really anything above 40 for those of you that have made the mistake as I have rushing out the house in the morning and taking zinc on an empty stomach, that car ride to work did not go over so well. It can cause nausea. And it's important to remember that iron supplements can inhibit, uh, intestinal zinc and copper absorption and vice versa. So zinc, oily scalp scalp issues of that nature can definitely help. Zinc is so wonderful for many other reasons, but in terms of the scalp disorder, it is a recommendation that I make. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about dry dandruff. So again, we're gonna look, looking, and we're looking for scales not yellow in color this time. We're looking for scales that are white in color. Erythema, so redness. Yes, you can see redness, again, with, yeah, uh, with dry dandruff. Unlike oily dandruff, there's flaking on the shoulders or flakes uh, are easily sort of falling off of the head when the hair is touched. 
no order, no odor rather. We can't really smell anything with dry dandruff. And we want to look at the location because the location of dry dandruff can tell us why somebody is experiencing this kind of dry flaking. We're going to ask, again, when is your scalp itchy? So ask yourself, ask your patient, ask your friend, when is your scalp itchy? Is it right after or is it as progressively as time goes on? So we know that with oily dandruff, the itchiness is progressively worse as time goes on. With dry dandruff, that's not always the case. It's kind of like dry skin, right? If you wash your skin in the middle of the winter and come out of the shower in Canada, the most parts of Canada, and you don't put any moisturizer on, the skin will kind of tighten up and, and dry. So it's itchy usually right away. What is your age, lifestyle, and washing habits? So dry dandruff can exist across the board at any age, but generally speaking, if your reproductive age is a little bit less common, when, when do you see the flakes? When you brush grout all the time. So dry dandruff, you'll see all the time. You'll see somebody will come and sit and for consultation and they'll see flakes on their shoulders. Is it worse in the winter? Probably. And are there any autoimmune diseases, diseases in the family? Now, why do I ask that? Because dry dandruff, which is less common, if I do see dry dandruff, I'm sort of always thinking about one particular disorder, which I'll mention in, in one sec. So I'll just to give you a visual, the difference between you know dandruff and dry dandruff, oily dandruff and dry dandruff. You can see that oily dandruff is a little stickier. It sticks to the hair, sticks to the scalp. And dry dandruff will be sort of flaking off into the hair. You'll see little speckles everywhere. Um, so visually, there's, there's quite a difference. And I would treat these two disorders very differently. Applying oil to the oily dandruff flakes is definitely going to make it worse. Whereas with di dry dandruff, that may be an option if that oil is specifically designed for this kind of an issue. We also, you know, going back to the skin diagnostic, um, uh, one of the, the most important tools that I have in the clinic here to identify if dandruff is truly dry or if it's maybe dried up oil is by taking a sebum reader and measuring those levels. It will tell me instantly what's happening. So even sometimes I, after many years of doing this, can't see physically what's happening. This tool really helps me identify what kind of dandruff is, 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 is uh, what kind of dandruff I have to deal with. The trichoscope is an important tool to identify if this is an uncomplicated case of dry skin or something more. So I've said already that I would ask about autoimmune disorders in the family. And why would I ask about that? Because if somebody says, yes, I have an autoimmune disorder in the family, my um, mom has, you know, uh, maybe rheumatoid arthritis, or maybe my father had alopecia areata, and I have a very itchy dryness on my scalp, what am I thinking of? psoriasis. So psoriasis, for many of you uh, that understand psoriasis, it can exist on the body, on the elbows, on the knees, but it can in exist also independently on the scalp. Psoriasis is a chronic autoimmune condition that affects the skin. And essentially what happens with psoriasis is the skin cells don't shed. So normally every 20 some odd days, skin cells are meant to shed. But with psoriasis, these skin cells keep reproducing and overproducing and overproducing and overproducing and it creates a plaque and it's extremely itchy, extremely itchy. And I had asked as one of the questions too, does it get worse in the winter? Yes, psoriasis absolutely gets worse in the winter. Not for the reasons that you may think though. It's not because the weather is drier, although that plays a factor as well. It's because in the winter, we have a lot less access to a wonderful magic vitamin. And if this was more of an interactive webinar, I would ask everybody to put something in the chat. But I think some of you are already on to what I'm, where I'm heading, which will be revealed shortly. So psoriasis, what can it look like? It can look like this. So if you Google psoriasis right now, you'd get this image and go, oh my gosh, that's pretty severe. I've never seen that before. But it can also look like this. So if you look at the scalp up close, this looks like broken capillaries. It looks like these red little squiggly lines. What are these capillaries? So the shape of the capillaries can tell us if this is a more complicated scalp disorder or more complicated dandruff, um, like psoriasis. So you'll see what we call U-shaped capillaries with psoriasis. Psoriasis can also look like this. And this is a very subtle case. I mean, this kind of Initially, it looks like maybe it could be just oily dandruff, but this person, in fact, has psoriasis, a mild uh, form of psoriasis. So it is 
I cannot stress how important it is to identify what's happening before you start to reach for a solution. What do I do in the clinic when I'm not sure? And I wouldn't advise somebody to do this on their own, but it is a telltale way to, to identify this disorder. What we do is a scrape test. So by scraping a little bit of that dried up, um, and I want to say dried up, it's not dry skin specifically, it's dead skin cells that have over accumulated. We'll scrape those dead skin cells off. And if I see a little bit of broken skin or bleeding, um, I'm almost certain that it is psoriasis. And of course, the U-shaped capillaries are present as well. So I know this is not a dandruff. This is not hygiene. This is not seborrheic dermatitis. This is an autoimmune skin scalp disorder that needs to be treated. So what is the connection with health? So we know that it's, uh, uh, you know, dry dandruff is an uncomplicated uh, form of scaling unless we identify something like psoriasis. Um, it's more common in people that don't have active sebaceous glands. So small children, maybe elderly. Uh, but if we do identify psoriasis, which is when people come to me saying they have dry scales and they're itchy, very irritated, um, it's important to understand that it's an autoimmune condition. Unhealthy eating or nutrition does not cause this problem. And that goes for psoriasis on the body as well. But there are, very, there are various therapies that we know can help. So what are those therapies? I said already about winter. What do we not see a lot in the wintertime? And I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in, in southern Ontario anyway, we have seen less sunlight this year than we have in I don't know how many uh, uh, how many years, but many. I just heard it sort of in passing and I felt that way. It's so gray every day. So I think about my people with psoriasis, my lovely patients that are probably suffering. I'm calling and telling, up your vitamin D. So vitamins for, for psoriasis, two vitamins, vitamin D, L-tyrosine, vitamin D. There is not ample. There is a, lots of evidence that shows a connection between vitamin D deficiency and all kinds of autoimmune disorders, but definitely psoriasis. So it's absolutely something I recommend. L-tyrosine is an amino acid, and I recommend L-tyrosine for all kinds of issues, patterned hair loss as well, but absolutely for autoimmune um, scalp disorders. Why? Uh, it reduces noradrenaline in the skin and can increase it in the brain. And I don't know if I've listed the contraindications here. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards, or I can send people more info, but we do not want to recommend it for people that have epilepsy, that are antidepressants, have cardiovascular issues. Uh, but certainly this therapy can work very well in the management of this scalp disorder. In severe cases, no surprise to my nutritionists listening in, sugar, gluten, dairy, inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. Um, probably not good for any of us for lots of reasons. I mean, I do recall uh, at IHN, I, we had a, a professor that talked about how milk was wonderful. And I'm sure, you know, there's people, I'm a cheese lover myself, but if I had psoriasis, if it was severe, I would probably cut out these three for a month to see if they have an impact. And that's the key. You really have to, if nothing else works topically, if we've done the supplements, um, the person maybe doesn't want to go on a systemic medication. Uh, and this is, we're talking about local, you know, top of uh, local uh, psoriasis on the scalp. We'll try cutting these three out for uh, about a month. And we'll see, um, we'll see if that helps. And that can give us a lot of insight. Other treatments include scalp therapy medications, uh, in some cases may be necessary to manage disorders. So I'm certainly not going to sit here and say we can fix psoriasis with nutrition and topicals. But if it is a mild to moderate case, I will opt for starting with that. And I think most people prefer that as well. So let's talk about a few other deficiencies that affect the hair. I don't want to go into all of them. There's a lot. I mean, like I've already said, we could probably talk all day about hair and deficiencies and how it's a barometer. But the main ones that I think are important for the purpose of this webinar are, oh, not yet. <laughs> Why are deficiencies important to the hair? Yeah, I suppose this is important to know. Um, again, fastest growing tissue on the body. So um, this means really the hair papilla cells are dividing so rapidly and producing many pro proteins such as keratin and this exceptional like rate of activity 
means that uh, hair follicles need a lot of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? We need a lot of energy, we need a lot of raw minerals, proteins, vitamins to grow, to keep growing and to be healthy. So there are lots of things that the hair needs, but specifically when I see a deficiency in these areas, I'm worried and I'm addressing it first. And what is that first area? Can anyone guess? I'm going to say everybody's saying, ah, oh, ferritin. Yes, iron, of course. Ferritin, which is the storage of iron in the blood. It's the storage of protein, uh, the protein iron. Um, it uh, is exceptionally important because hair is mostly protein. Hair is a high sulfur, fast growing protein, and a deficiency in ferritin will affect the hair. Absolutely. And without going into too much science about the action of ferritin in the tissues, um, you know, essentially the iron deficiency can result in reduction of tissue oxygen leading to reduced energy production and reduced cell division. So if there's an iron deficiency, absolutely, I am treating that first. If somebody comes into my office and they're a vegan or vegetarian and they're a female, I am absolutely checking that in the blood work because... If you are a menstruating female, guess what? You need more protein. Your hair needs more protein. So what are the numbers? What, what are we looking for? So a normal range, if we look at blood work today, ferritin is about 18 to 270. Um, and if you're at 18, your doctor's going to go, oh, you're fine. You know, you're going to live. You're going to be, you're not going to faint. No problem here, ma'am uh, or mister. Uh, but ferritin hair, hair sufficiency, it's largely sort of agreed upon that it's about 40 to 69. And I would say that the number 40 is stable. Improved number of 70 to 125, or I would even say 70 to 90. So if somebody comes into your office and their blood work, their ferritin levels are 40, getting them up to 70 is not going to suddenly make their hair grow like crazy. But, you know, we do want to keep the number about around 40. A uh, prescription recommendation that I use for iron, and there are some better actually iron supplements now that combine some of these things. And long gone are the days where I say, you know, take an iron pill with, with a glass of orange juice, but I prefer iron combined with vitamin C, combined with L-lysine. Um, this is the normal daily dosage. Uh, the L-lysine and the vitamin C, of course, help with absorption. But how somebody decides to treat this deficiency, you know, I'm going to say that is completely up to the practitioner. Uh, I always opt to start with diet. I have a beautiful brochure that I uh, that I that I hand out that talks about how we can just get those sources from food, and then of course supplementing uh, is the next step. If we have to get um, a prescription, that is the last. Prescriptions can be a little bit tough, especially um, uh, if it's a you know a heme iron. Um, so anyway, moving on to vitamin D. So we've already talked about vitamin D, but I thought if there's a message I want to get across to everybody today, like if you had to leave with a few nuggets of information, I would say iron, think about iron when you think about hair and think about vitamin D. And you know that vitamin D in its, in its, active, form is, in its active form is actually hormone and not a vitamin. It's available in D2 and D3. And uh, as, as most of us know, D3 is the preferable form. So we get some vitamin D from our food, but only about 10%. So it's so, so important to supplement with vitamin D. And it's so important to, in moderation, have some exposure. And it's also, oh, I skipped a slide. I was going to show the next slide. But what does vitamin D do to the hair? Of course, we need to know this. Vitamin D receptors, or VDRs, regulate cell growth, regulate hair growth. BDRs are an important part of the uh, um, hair cycling process and especially antigen initiation. So when we think antigen, think growth phase, right? Um, a vitamin D deficiency is not just correlated with all these autoimmune disorders that are on the rise, but absolutely with hair loss. What is the problem that I see? Regular routine blood work rarely considers vitamin D. Not if somebody's coming from a medical doctor, unfortunately. If you're working with a naturopath doctor, maybe a nutritionist, it's a little bit more common, but I always will ask for vitamin D. So I don't have the normal range here, but above 75 is normal. The hair, the hair likes a little bit more because we know the hair grows really quickly. So we want to have that number to be closer to like 99 or above for vitamin D. 
The normal daily dosage is 400 to 800 IU. Trichologically, I recommend at least 1,000. And of course, a medical prescription, if somebody's highly deficient, they can once a week, uh, you do 50,000 IUs. So what I was getting at with vitamin D, because a lot of people seem to not know this, but remember, how much vitamin D you need depends on two things. And what are those two things? One, is it coming? There it is. Climate, where you live. Do you live in the North Pole? Do you live in the Amazon? Do you live in, looks like could be, I don't know where Bambi is, and in Canada, I guess, our fruit so. So it depends on where you live and depends on, yes, how much melanin you have in your skin. The more melanin you have in your skin, and if you live in a polar zone, you need to supplement with more vitamin D. The less melanin that's in your skin, the less vitamin D you need in general. But let's say I've, you know, I've less melanin in my skin and I live in Costa Rica. Well, maybe I don't need to take as many as much vitamin D. So it's important to consider these two things when we're making vitamin D recommendations. So I'm almost done here, I think, and I was going to put on a timer and I'm sorry I haven't. I hope I'm not going over as I tend to do sometimes. I want to leave off with a few quick tips for hair, for healthy hair. And I like to refer to this as the holy trinity of hair loss. But when you think about how you can help your hair right now, you want to think of three things. One, topically. What are you using topically? And I am not. don't mean like is there, you know, sulfates? Is there, is it natural? I mean, is it designed for your scalp type? Something can be 100% natural, but it's not designed for your scalp type. So it's probably making your hair worse. Two, internally, is there any deficiencies? Do you know if there's any deficiencies? More importantly, have you been tested? You may be eating a balanced diet, but are you absorbing everything properly? And in clinic treatments, I would say. So if you're doing everything topically right, you think so. You're doing everything internally right because your practitioner told you so, but you're still not getting, seeing results, then it's probably time to see somebody in clinic and have your scalp tested and maybe even do in-clinic treatments to achieve better results. And very quickly on the topical note, you know, what to choose. I've already talked about this. I'm not going to go already. And the market is flooded with products. You know, I would say the main takeaway is here. If your scalp is oily, wash it more often. If your skin was oily on your face, you would probably wash it more often. <laughs> Uh, and with ingredients that are designed for, for the scalp specifically. If your sc dry, scalp is dry, it's not about washing it less, but it's about washing it with an ingredient that is designed for that scalp type. And I'm not recommending any of these products here, by the way. These are literally just copied and pasted from the internet, just different products for hair. I actually don't sell any of these. But I thought, you know, if you don't know what to use at the end of the day, have your scalp analyzed and you will know what to use. In terms of the internals, of course, balanced diet is important. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, you know, protein. Protein is, 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 is it's very possible to get enough protein in your diet if you're vegan or vegetarian, but you have to be a really good eater. You have to be really mindful with how you cook for yourself and how you eat. You likely don't eat myotin. I'm sorry, you don't. If you're taking it, you can stop. Ferritin, just a quick little note here. Good numbers are 70 to 90. Uh, B12, we didn't talk about B12 because I don't have the time here today too much. B12 deficiency rarely causes a lot of hair loss, but keep it above 365, 380. Vitamin D above 99. And TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating, ho stimulating hormone, uh, below 2.5 is ideal. And again, for another time, we can talk about the endocrine system and thyroid and hormones and, you know, we can go on and on. But I would say if somebody has a thought TSH level above 2.5, I'm keeping an eye on it. I'm not panicking. I'm not telling them they're going to lose all their hair, but I'm keeping an eye on it and I'm probably guiding them towards uh, maybe alternative therapies that will manage their thyroid. In terms of the in-clinic treatments, I would say if you you know, don't know what's going on, if you uh, uh, sort of you know, aren't seeing the results, uh, if you've never seen somebody professional about your hair scalp, you probably need to. And really think of you know your skin again. If you had uh, an issue with the skin that you're managing well, but then you probably don't need to see a medical esthetician or a dermatologist. But if you're not managing it well, and it is worse, worsening, you do need to see a professional. Why? Active ingredients penetrate deeper, you'll get faster results, and you'll get lasting results, not just something temporary and sudden. So a few pictures, some of these are a little bit older, but of the results that I got, and if 
for those of you that were listening, you'll notice that on the top left, we have a temporal picture. And guess what? This is Helgen effluvium. So this person, I didn't uh, magically regrow their hair with any potions. We did work on nutrition and some other things and regrew the hair a little bit faster, but it probably would have regrown on its own. The other uh, pictures here are different kinds of hair loss that we've treated over the years. So on that note, um, I'm going to leave off with a few things. As, uh, yes, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, I am an IIT certified trichologist. For those of you that are interested in becoming a certified trichologist, here's the QR code for IAT, the International Association of Trichology, uh, trichologists rather. Um, if you're interested in trichology, but you don't want to do the full certification, something that uh, uh, would be interesting for uh, those of you that want to pursue this field, maybe in complementing your own practice, is getting the H, uh, the Hair Practitioner Certificate um, from IAT. This is a condensed version of the full course that I teach in the clinic here. And that runs, I'm going to say, maybe biannually. We're trying to do it a little bit more often. The next course is actually next weekend. There may still be room. We actually thought this this webinar would happen uh, a few weeks ago initially, but um, if anybody's interested in that, we can talk about it. Um, I had to talk about the Canadian Hair Loss Council, my own little sort of passion project that is a little baby that's just started, but I do believe in raising awareness for those people suffering in silence with hair loss, with scalp disorders, and this foundation, this nonprofit was created to help. Uh, uh, become a voice for those people, but also to connect professionals. So to connect trichologists with dermatologists, with nutritionists, and help us all work together. And I think that's it. I think I've gone through everything and hopefully in, in a timely manner. So this is, uh, this is our, our website and, and my Instagram and my email for those of you that I can't get to today and answer your questions. I'm so happy to do that through email and I'm so happy to have you here and give you a tour if you're local and answer your questions in person as well. So thank you. We have some great questions. Ah, uh, Okay. Uh, when would you get a hair transplant? This is from Faye. That's her first question. Number two, alopecia versus hair loss, which I think you addressed. Uh, okay, okay, there's quite a few questions here. Let's just, when would you get Ooh, a hair transplant? Let's power through. Transplant. Oh, okay. So if I was a woman, I wouldn't get a hair transplant. Uh, uh, there are very few women that are good candidates for hair transplants. You have to have very good donor hair in the back. Women go through shock loss. It can be... Uh, you can't hear me? Oh, oh I think... Uh, Can everybody hear me? I think you can hear me, but I... Uh... Your sound is good. Oh, okay. You're good. Okay, okay. I couldn't hear you. All right. Yeah. So, okay, perfect. Thanks, Connie. So basically, yes, if you're a woman transplant, not so much. Have your hair line looked at uh, by a trichologist, maybe a surgeon that has experience with female hair transplants. Not only are women generally not good candidates, the results aren't that great. And uh, yeah, so I would say if you're a man, when would you get a hair transplant? After 30 years old. So you want to wait till that hairline has uh, hair loss pattern has uh, uh, presented itself almost fully, and we know what we have to work with. So um, and I wouldn't do it too young. Okay, perfect. And uh, what shampoo and conditioner would you recommend for hair loss? Okay, so this is like asking what eye cream would you recommend for wrinkles <laughs> right. actually it's even more complicated than that because when you say hair loss i'm thinking of the 55 different reasons why somebody's losing their hair oh i think can you hear me we can hear you yeah okay so what's happened was my airpods died because this is a very long webinar ah, so if you can still hear me that's good so yeah. uh Basically, uh, I would say, first of all, you have to find out why you're losing your hair. And the last thing that we're, we're thinking about what uh, in terms of what to use, because unless you know why you're losing your hair, you know, you won't know what product to use. Can you 
Is that okay? Can you hear? I hear you. I hear. Yeah. I see lips moving, but we can hear out. you. Yeah, we're good. Okay, perfect. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, we have to find out what's right. causing the problem before we can make recommendations. And uh, does does wearing a hat contribute to hair loss? No. No, um, there is a hair loss disorder called traction alopecia, where you can, uh, you know, create hair loss over time by pulling the hair back or wearing it in a specific way. But no, your hair gets oxygen nutrition from, you know, the capillaries. So wearing a hat will not cause hair loss. And how often should you wash your hair if your hair is thin and flat and gets oily and dry one day after washing? Uh, and, and dry one day after washing. Say yeah. Or- yeah. She wrote, uh, her hair is thin and flat and gets oily and dry one day after washing. Wash it as often as you want. <laughs> if your scalp is oily and flat, wash your hair. Um, uh, there's, you, there's no such thing as oil training or washing it less often to, you know, make it less oily. Um, really think about the face. Your scalp is oily. Your face is oily. You want to wash it more frequently than not. And the reason why your hair is getting drier, to be honest, oil is a waxy ester. So as it builds up around the follicle funnel, it heart hardens. So it, if you don't wash it off often enough, it will harden and won't remain fluid. Mm-hmm. And therefore the hair ends will become drier and drier and your scalp will become more oily. So if you want your ends to become less dry, wash your scalp more often. Okay, very good. And uh, we have a question from Megan in regards to stress management. What is the best way to support your hair? Maybe you experience a sudden increase in gray hairs in your early 20s, is your pigmentation likely to come back after the stressful period? So um, gray hair. Gray hair uh, is the result of usually genetics, frankly. There is a kind of um, shock to the hair the where the melanocytes are affected, where you see overnight somebody will go completely gray. That is a very rare condition, but generally speaking, if you started to grow gray in your 20s and it was correlated with a stressful event, um, the stress didn't cause the grayness. The gray would have probably already happened. Uh, and no, I'm sorry, the only way to get rid of it is probably coloring. So, which is safe, by the way, and won't cause more hair loss for those of you that are afraid to color. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, there's organic, there's definitely organic lines. Yeah, there's absolutely. There's some great um, organic lines. I know of 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 a few salons out there that use some wonderful natural hair color. Okay, wonderful. And Connie was asking about. Uh, I see she seems to shed a lot of hair in the fall for a couple of months, then it stops. Is that normal? Mm-hmm. So a seasonal shedding is not uncommon. Um, uh, we, like many animals in the animal kingdom, will lose a little bit more hair in the fall, <laughs> pun intended. <Yeah. laughs> okay, Mara says, my son has had dandruff for most of his childhood years. He's 11 years old. Hmm. Is this something I should be concerned about? What is causing it and how can I remedy it naturally? So at 11 years old, so again, dandruff, when we think dandruff, we think flakes. So why would a child that small have flakes? Is it cradle cap? Um, is it a yeast on the scalp? It's possible, you know, the um, uh, sebaceous glands are there when a child is that age, but they're not really active until puberty. So the child is not able to uh, kill yeast or microbes effectively because that that ester is not being produced properly. So um, if you're really concerned, I would have the scalp analyzed. Um, I will mention that dandruff flaking is a precursor to hair loss for young men. So usually starts a little bit later. So teenage boys that have seborrheic dermatitis or oily dandruff, that can translate to male pattern hair loss in their 20s. Okay. Um, is male pattern baldness a maternal hereditary gene? No, it's it's not maternal. Um, it can be inherited from both the maternal or paternal sides. It's a dominant trait, meaning it can skip generations. 
We have cases where people have both parents with fantastic hair, and then they have a grandfather on one side that has patterned hair loss. He started to lose his hair in his 40s. The grandchild can start to exhibit those features as well. The bottom line is if you're a man and you're losing your hair or you're worried about losing your hair, look at your family history. The more people in your family that have pattern hair loss, the more likely you are to exhibit that. One more thing I'm going to mention about that is uh, there are certain uh, age ranges where it's more common to start to exhibit these features. So I would say between 17 and 22 years old, if a young boy is starting to thin, boy, yeah, I guess it's a boy, thinning in the vertex, then that could be the first sign of genetic hair loss. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is it possible or common to have more than one hair loss disorder at the same time? Can one disorder trigger another? Yes and yes. It is absolutely not uncommon to have an autoimmune disorder, a genetic disorder, and then a disorder because you're deficient in one or two or three different areas. Um, that's complicated to treat, but uh, we always treat one condition at a time. And there was a second part of that question that I said yes to, which I for just forgot. There was the first part was, is it common to have multiple conditions at the same time? And just remind me, the second part of the question was... Uh, and can one trigger the other? Can one trigger the other? Yes. So sh um, sh this shedding that I referred to, or telogen effluvium, can push other hair loss disorders along. So for instance, you uh, maybe had COVID and got very sick and shed a lot of hair. That could trigger an autoimmune response in the hair or could push along an androgenetic predisposition. So that genetic hair loss could sort of happen a little bit sooner if you have a sudden shed. Okay, very good. Uh, Shreya has a question. Uh, can you have a combination scalp? Yes, you can, absolutely. And what we'll see is because uh, I like to say this is where the party happens, okay? So this is where we have androgen receptors, hormonal receptors. So the scalp is a little bit more oily here. Disorders, different disorders exist here. Um, and then in the back of the head where we don't have these hormonal receptors, we can have things like psoriasis or hair loss due to stress and deficiencies. And they can happen at the same time, yes. Okay. And what are the optimal levels of ferritin? So 40 is stable. I would say 70 to 90 is optimal. Is there a way to stop hair loss associated with tell elf? Oh, telgen effluvium? Stop it, no. But uh, the key with telgen effluvium is to come out of it as quickly as possible. So this is, I've said, a temporary self-corrective hair loss. Um, it's temporary, yes. It's self-corrective if there's no other underlying condition. So if that individual has, is anemic, they're going to keep shedding, right? They got sick, they had a baby, they started shedding in postpartum, quite normal. The shedding continues. Why? Because there's there's anemia there. So um, the key is to uh, come out of it quickly and, and really come to terms with the, that the hair that you're losing, the hair that is falling is dead hair. It's not healthy hair. It's not alive. We don't want it on our head anymore, even though we'd like to have to keep it. Let it go, as Elsa says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As and, yeah, no, that's great. And Megan, are scalp massages beneficial to stimulate blood flow and hair growth, or do they damage the follicles? Yeah, great question. No, scalp massages are great. Scalp massages absolutely improve microcirculation. Um, so massage away, absolutely a good idea. Any hair that is firmly rooted in the scalp and growing well and healthy will not be affected by a good scalp massage. Excellent. And what are your thoughts on microneedling for hair loss? No, there's actually uh, some good research in terms of microneedling for hair loss. Um, it has been used, uh, microneedling has been used in combination with growth factors, with exosomes in some places, with minoxidil and topical steroids with auto for autoimmune conditions. So yes, microneedling uh, is a very good and viable option for certain hair loss disorders. Right. 
And then I know um, one of our alumni, Joy McCarthy, she's a big proponent of rosemary oil. Yeah. Uh, so this question from Marina, can, this essential, question. <laughs> can uh, essential oils and natural hair products or shampoos, conditioners affect the overall health of hair and scalp and possibly change the, or possibly change the pH negatively or positively? Okay, so there's a lot of... Um... A uh, lot to dissect in that question. So yes, essential oils are great for uh, the hair. The right essential oils in the right amounts and formulated properly. Essential oils, for those of you that understand essential oils, are wonderful, but they are sort of mass used, advertised, and they can be toxic. They can be unsafe in some cases, so we have to be careful. That being said, um, I am going to touch on the rosemary oil because it is something that's very popular in uh, Canada for sure. Uh, and I recently actually a magazine called me to interview me about this, this, this uh, particular topical as well. I think I have no problem with rosemary oil. I think it can work very well for certain people. Mm -hmm. um, but I do stand behind what I said earlier, where in a place where there isn't a cure for something, everybody is a cure. So that means that rosemary oil will work for some. But as a professional, as a trichologist, I have to look at the research. And the, what does the research show? The research doesn't show very much because there was one study done, the 10, what was it now, 2015? Yeah, it was 2015 by a small group that compared 2% minoxidil to rosemary. So two in males. So 2% is a substandard formula for minoxidil for men for sure. And in that study, it showed that there was some statistically significant improvement. Statistical significance is very different from clinical significance. So something can be statistically significant. So there's a number that's increased, but clinically insignificant. So the research shows that yes, statistically, it's we've seen improvement, but clinically, not really. What I tell somebody don't use rosemary oil? No, absolutely not. If you find that it's going to help you and it works for you, thumbs up. Have I seen many people that it doesn't work for? Absolutely. I think the key messaging is find out what's causing your hair loss first before you apply something natural, not natural. We can make that decision together, but you have to understand what's causing the problem first, instead of reaching for, you know, whatever's popular at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And uh, let's see what else we have here. If someone dyes their hair, would it affect or cause hair loss over time? I think you answered this one. Not really. I mean, not, I would like, you know, not really, not really, because if you're getting your color done professionally, modern colors, a lot of them are, you know, ammonia, PPD free. If you had contact dermatitis because of a color, a reaction, then it's possible that will cause shedding. But the thinning that happens over time is usually the result of other factors, um, not the color that you've been doing. We'd like to, we'd like to think so, but no. And do you recommend derma rolling for stimulating the scalp and what pressure would you apply? Do I recommend it? No. Am I opposed to it? Not really. There again, it's it's the lack of research. Microneedling, there's a little bit more research with microneedling. I'm a little bit more familiar. Derma rolling is tricky. I mean, you're injuring the skin. Um, you're going to, uh, depending on the pressure you apply, if you combine it with the topical, you can have a reaction. You can cause more damage than good. So I would say at your own sort of risk, I don't recommend it in the clinic here. No. Okay. And is apple cider vinegar diluted good for a rinse of the scalp? Apple cider vinegar is good for a rinse of the hair. So apple cider vinegar, as we know, is acidic. And we've talked about how acidity in the scalp keeps the pH low and is good. What apple cider vinegar will do is, is sort of seal the cuticle. So if for those of you that ever had, you know, maybe parents or grandparents use apple cider vinegar or, or cherry vinegar as a rinse after washing your hair as a child for shine, that's why it's, you know, useful because it'll sort of cute close the cuticle. But as a rinse for the scalp, 
Mm, not necessarily. Um, and again, it depends. It depends on the issue. If you don't have any scalp disorders, if you don't have any hair loss issues, you could probably apply all kinds of natural remedies and feel that they work for you. But I don't think it would uh, affect the hair in a significantly positive way. Okay. Very good. And are tyrosine and vitamin D beneficial for alopecia or areota too? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So if we have any autoimmune disorder of the scalp, scarring or non-scarring, so alopecia areata, totalis, maybe less so, you know, at that point where it's a little bit more complicated, but scarring alopecias. So there's an alopecia called uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia where the hairline begins to recede back. Um, this is autoimmune as well. I will recommend L-tyrosine across the board for all of these. Okay. And then would you recommend a chlorine filter on the shower head? Does chlorine affect the quality of your hair? That's oh, funny. You should ask. I have actually a chlorine filter in my house uh, for lots of reasons, not just the hair. Um, I think it's fine. Uh, uh, filters that filter out chemicals in the water are good. I'm a little bit more weary of water softeners because I find that it can leave an excess film or residue on the scalp and the hair, which can cause more damage. But uh, a chlorine filter, yeah, I'd say th thumbs up. Um, you know, the less sort of chemicals we put on our bodies, probably the better. But again, no research to show that it's going to grow the hair back or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. I think there was just uh, a couple here in the... Uh, there is a student here, um, Elise. She's almost done the IHN program. She's not graduated just yet. She was wondering, is she eligible to take your course and how can she be on your mailing list for your next workshop? Yeah, so uh, if you, I can show the slide again or we can share my contact information. Just reach out to me directly. Um, the next course, like I said, is next weekend. Uh, we host it right here. So uh, I believe we still have a couple spots left. You could probably jump onto that one if you wanted to. Uh, the next one we are hosting is actually in Vancouver. I can't believe I didn't talk about that. I don't know where everybody is ah. going, but um, it's going to be in April. April... I should know off the top of my head, I want to say four, five, six, but is on our Academy website. So we'll be hosting it there. And I'm hoping to take it, you know, uh, across the country, but in Mississauga, we try to have them at least twice a year. Okay. That's beautiful. And yeah. some of uh, Alexandria was wondering about nutritionists. And I know you said you have a couple at right at your clinic that you recommend, right? What was the, yeah, we have, we have, so the co-op student that joined us is going to be uh, working out of the clinic now. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Caroline, that was superb. We want to thank you so much for your time, your thank you. wonderful presentation. That was a great Q&A with lots of uh, amazing information. Thank you to everyone that came today and uh, was able to spend this wonderful time with Caroline and and uh, and learn some wonderful things about trichology and what she does at her clinic and all these uh, incredible details around our hair and our scalp. So lots of excellent information. We hope you enjoy the, uh, the wonderful, generous gifts that uh, Caroline was able to give out today. And we look so forward to seeing all of you again soon. Uh, there will be a replay of this and it will also be on our YouTube channel. So Caroline, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you all. <laughs> and I'm so happy uh, that I was able to do this. Like I said, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions after this. I'm so happy to answer them all. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Everyone. day, Caroline. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.